Thank, thank you. Uh, can you all hear us uh, fairly well? I think it's working. Okay. Well, as uh, you will know from the program, my name is Volker Berghahn. I'm not a Central European this in the strict sense, but uh, I did German history, but I inherited um, the chair that Istvan had for many, many years, and uh, I knew him, of course, very well. But I know that some of you must be quite exhausted because you came from Europe and you are still jet-lagged, so I'm not going to say many words, but wanted to say three things. The first one is since this is our last session, uh, and I am a member of the history department, but uh, I should say that I'm now, and this is really a Columbia tradition, isn't it? I am a zero salary lecturer. <laughs> that gives me the right to grade people and have uh, undergraduates and MA students, which I always enjoy because just like Istvan, I believe very much in interchange and education. Um, so I wanted to uh, say briefly to thank not only uh, Dominique, but also uh, Allah in the, uh, in the Harriman Institute and a number of good spirits who've really organized this conference. And if you have ever organized a conference like this, you know how much work it is. So I would like to thank all of them, uh, I hope also in your name, uh, for this wonderful event that they helped to organize and it all worked, it seemed to me, perfectly. Uh, and we had some very inspiring and very good sessions. The second point I wanted to make is that I did know Istvan, of course, very well, but from a different perspective than you know, his students, because we were not only colleagues, but also lived close by. And I, for many years, took very long walks. And that was often a challenge, because as you know from the program, the photo, he was very good at not only walking, but also at marathon. And I wasn't that good at it, but we always had very good intellectual uh, discussions. And uh, the Riverside Park always reminds me of the Philosophenweg in Heidelberg, where, as you probably know, many well-known scholars uh, met always and talked about the world. And that is what we did. And I must say, I was very glad that, indeed, towards the end of this conference, there were a number of questions which raised the connection between history and our present predicament both in this country and also in East Central Europe. And that is what I think we often talked about. And I should say that uh, Istvan uh, was very critical, of course, uh, during the Trump years, certainly, of what was going on in this country. But at the same time, I was always struck by his deep commitment to American society, because that was the society that had made it possible for him to have a very successful career. And I don't think he ever forgot this. But when we talked, we actually talked often about our identity problems. Uh, you know, he coming from Hungary, having lived in France after the war for many years, and then having come to this country. I coming from Germany, having taught in Britain, and then having come to this country. And there is, of course, this very fascinating question that we all ask ourselves, not only where do we come from, but how were we shaped, shaped by different cultures, academic cultures in particular. And I think we both always enjoyed our comparative discussions about these uh, problems that he was ultimately also grappling with because uh, Sabra Bekesh mentioned a brief contribution that I made to this uh, history, his, his dop, uh, diplo, diplo um, uh, essay that uh, he organized. And in that case, I actually tried to raise the question of his identity also. And I was always struck 
by how much it was a really a mix of American traditions that he had and cultures that he had adopted, but also, of course, of Hungarian culture. And uh, he never forgot these roots. Then finally, I want to mention, of course, our keynote speaker this evening, and it's perhaps unusual that a keynote should be at the end of it, but uh, I certainly look forward to having the grand view of uh, Ishvan and his, his work now. Uh, but uh, I would like to make this very brief, uh, uh, but I wanted to mention an act anecdote which uh, happened, I happened to observe many years ago. Uh, this was the keynote speak of Gordon Craig, whom all of you will remember and whose books you may have read. And uh, he was at a conference and gave the keynote speaker and the introducer said actually, well, you all know Gordon Craig, don't you? Here he is. <laughs> and that was it. And then, then the organizer of this uh, or, uh, conference rushed up to the rostrum and uh, introduced Gordon Craig. And I would like to avoid, of course, that Dominic rushes off <laughs> to, to the rostrum now by me not saying anything about Peter. But as you know, he was born in Holland, and uh, I think uh, then, uh, I don't know, you probably went to school in Holland, and then eventually you came to this country and studied at Swarthmore College. And after that, you came to Columbia to do your PhD. Yeah, but it seemed to me that at Sw Swarthmore, they so liked you that they rehired you once you had your PhD. But then you flitted off to Europe again, and you are now at this wonderful place, the European uh, University Institute, up in the hills above Florence, which some of you may know, and I'm sure that you will want to stay there for the rest of your life, even though it is in Italy, and you may sometimes wonder <laughs> how long that, uh, that uh, government is going to, uh, to survive. Uh, but I also wanted to mention, of course, that uh, you wrote your first important book uh, on uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the revolutionaries of uh, uh, Austria-Hungary and 1848 um, in 1996, I believe, and then subsequently published a number of books as we all do, but then uh, you were tempted, presumably by some publisher, to write a textbook of the Habsburg Empire, which I should say, at least from all the reviews I have seen, was very well received and which I will also, so I'm sure, will earn you many prizes because you got for your first book the Baxter Prize already, you had a Guggenheim, you have many, many uh, achievements to your credit. So with this, um, I would like to hand over to Peter because we very much look forward to your keynote speak at the end of this conference. Thank you. Never in my life did I imagine that I would be introduced with sentences that included the name Gordon Craig, <laughs> which I'm old enough to remember just what that means. Um, thank you, Volker, for your very kind words of introduction. Um, it's true, I do come to you today from a fascist country, uh, at least a country that has a fascist prime minister. Um, so I may be returning to the United States in the next year. Um, I was going to, the title of my talk, and I'm really glad that you're all still here and all still awake, because it's been a very intense and moving day. I was going to call, well, I call my talk the Deac Turn, because we have turns, right? The Deac Turn in East Central Europe, except that as Malgosha reminded me uh, at the break, there is no more East Central Europe, or nobody knows what it is, so we'll just call it the Deac Turn. I'm 
very happy to be able to share this moment with all of you, with Ishran's family and friends, students and colleagues. And I think it's obvious from today that together, together we make up a very close community. And I want to thank the organizers, and especially Dominique, uh, for making this wonderful reunion possible, because this is a family reunion. Together, I think we constitute a group, a unique group, and we have for many years. Many members of our community from both sides of the Atlantic cannot be with us today. Many of them are in Montreal at the German Studies Association giving talks on panels that Ishvan would definitely have approved of. Um, but I want to acknowledge all of them today. They also form a part of this family reunion. When she learned about today's program, Gloria and Ishvan's dear friend in Vienna and Ishvan's longtime sparring partner, Waltraud Heindel, wrote how happy she was to learn about this symposium, and especially that Eva would be attending. Particularly, she loved what she called, quote, the enchanting but zauberant photograph of a young Ishvan receiving his doctorate. And then, because of the special nature of their relationship, she said, quote, it would have flattered his vanity, unquote. <laughs> More seriously, she added, quote, so many of his former students are speaking, and he, he would have been so elated. He had a special relationship with each of you. And I heard this, she said, repeatedly in all the many stories he told. Having listened to today's brilliant panels, little remains for me actually to say about Ishvan, about our special relationship, and about his qualities as a friend, as mentor, as a colleague, except that I will add that you can all now imagine the expression on his face when I told him I was going to learn Czech instead of Hungarian. But <laughs> This occasion, of course, has offered us the opportunity to articulate exactly how we want to remember and why we celebrate dear Istvan. But this occasion is also an opportunity to consider his valuable legacy in the larger fields of history in which he was so deeply involved. We remember him with such affection. We don't need anyone to tell us how he shaped the study of history for us, his students, colleagues, and friendly combatants like Waltraud. But in future years, historians who study 19th and 20th century Europe, they will not have met Istvan. They will not have heard him heard him weave narratives in lectures, nor will they have experienced his very sensible interventions in discussions. With luck, they may read some of his publications. Unless they read carefully between the lines, they also may not experience the humor that he brought to many of these discussions. But they won't have experienced the unique combination of humanity and scholarship that he embodies for all of us who knew him. For all these reasons, I believe that it's critical for us right now to start to define for a larger audience the particulars of his legacy as a historian, both of Europe and of that region that used to be called East Central Europe. To contribute to this process, I agreed to say a few general words today, but now I realize I, there was no point to this invitation. I was asked by Mark Mazauer to say something about how the scholarship in East Central Europe had changed, thanks to Istvan. Well, I think we now know, after hearing all the panels. Um, today's, today we heard how difficult it is, and perhaps pointless, to separate the humane teacher and colleague from the approaches to history that he embodied. And I think we can all agree that Ishvan's attitudes towards his fellow human beings shaped the ways that he approached historical figures and the situations in which they found themselves. His empathy looked well beyond crudely simplistic labels of identity. His critical judgment saw beyond utopian ideological claims we could call him an insider 
regarding the region and events about which he wrote, given his life experience and his country of origin. As an insider, Istvan instinctively understood that the differences, for example, between perpetrators, collaborators, and victims in history often depended more on how people responded to the impossible demands of situations in which they found themselves. It didn't depend on their inherent identities. Whether someone was a man or a woman, young or old, Jew or Gentile, national or a-national, working class or elite, could not alone determine their actions in history. And over and over again today, we've heard this same point made in many articulate ways. But on the other hand, Istvan was himself a refugee, an exile, who always, I believe, applied an outsider's critical perspectives perspective to his region of origin. Istvan might have wished to become an historian in France had it been possible, but it wasn't. And his doctorate, as we heard, examined the politics of a group of left-wing intellectuals in Weimar, Germany, not East Central Europe. He did not intend to become an historian of East Central Europe, his region of origin, and as he tells it, in the wonderful taped interviews conducted by Holly Case and Mate Rigo, and I urge all of you to listen to those, they're just so moving. Uh, he almost fell into the field by accident. Well, maybe. I mean, this is Istvan telling the story, right? He recounts that at a meeting with his supervisor, Fritz Stern, and I, oh, I should tell you this anecdote really quickly, because we were talking earlier, hearing earlier about how Ishvan never forced his students to choose a topic uh, and how he supported us even when we went in directions he didn't feel comfortable with. He told me that when he'd sent his final dissertation to Fritz Stern, he got a one-line answer in reply, which was, this was not the topic we agreed upon. <laughs> it can't be true, right? It can't be. Anyway. So at a meeting with Fritz Stern and Henry Roberts, who was then the director of Columbia's program on East Central Europe, Istvan was told that he could count on a position at Columbia, but he would be needed for that particular program. Roberts soon left Columbia in 1967, and Dayak was put in charge of what later became a full-fledged institute on East Central Europe that many of us remember well. Although, as Malgosha said, East Central Europe doesn't exist anymore. Well, gradually, I think, he shifted fields. He didn't give up his vast knowledge of German or even of French history. He used it all the time with us. But he began to write more explicitly about Hungary and East Central Europe. And as I thought about this switch recently, I realized how little I know of the details of this. Like, how did this really happen? Is it really because of that one meeting with Henry Roberts and Fritz Stern? Because Istvan was actually already writing in this field, writing Hungarian history. Some of you might recall a long book chapter on Hungary from 1918 to 1945 in an edited volume called The European Right, edited by Hans Roger and Eugene Weber. And this essay was actually the first thing I ever read by Ishvan as an undergraduate. I've assigned this chapter many times. It's really beautifully written uh, to my own students. Well, I reread it the other day with great pleasure. In it, Ishvan finds these turns of phrases to characterize with such astuteness and so much irony, and others of you have mentioned the irony as well, the Hungarian political actors of the period. He made a subject about which I knew absolutely nothing, wildly engaging, both fun in the sense of a fascinating puzzle, and also tragic and exciting at a very human level. Now I realize that Hungary chapter was actually published in 1964, commissioned well before Istvan had even written his dissertation on Weimar Germany. So luckily, Paul Hannebrink explained to me last night that this chapter was in fact a version of Ishvan's MA thesis. Because up until now, I had always wondered, he wasn't, was he a Hungarian historian? Now I know. 
Thank you, Paul. And this is the other thing. There are so many stories that we all need to tell each other to get a more complete picture of this very complex and wonderful man. But it still would be another 15 years before Ishvan would publish a full book in the field of East Central Europe, and that was his inspiring history of Kossuth and the Hungarian 1848-49. Ishvan was already in 1964 with his MA thesis, clearly a known go-to figure in this field. So now I think I need to say just a few words about how the field of East Central Europe was understood and practiced back then in those days, and still even by some people today, no names mentioned. It was a field of study that I think was over I'm sorry, because I know all of you are experts, so I'm telling you what you already know, but Mark asked me to say something about this, so I will. It was a field of study that was overdetermined, as were most fields of study, by the Cold War. It was a time in which modernization theory and big economic explanations, structural explanations, sought to determine what had allegedly gone wrong in the region's development this region that was apparently so different from developments in Western Europe. From the point of view of economic, social, and cultural developments, many scholars back then saw East Central Europe's history in the 19th century as a series of failures. It's interesting that they applied this highly moral language to history writing. They explained these failures in part because supposedly the region had never um, overcome the conflicts among nationalists, the way that the societies of the West had done, allegedly. East Central Europe had never had the opportunity to develop the kind of politically and socially stable nation states that in the West had become engines for economic development and social prosperity. Instead, East Central Europe was dominated by outdated empires that sought to keep their colonized peripheries poor and underdeveloped, that exploited local elites, and that present, prevented any civic life from developing. After 1918, despite emancipation from the prisons of the peoples, like the Habsburg monarchy, the region's economic and social backwardness prevented the development of a kind of democratic politics that characterized the more successful West. I am saying this with a great deal of irony. I hope that's clear. I always wonder, by the way, which West did they mean? Um, were they talking about Portugal? Were they talking about Ireland? Were they, no, Spain maybe? Many scholars understood the Soviet Union at the time as a particular kind of colonizing empire in East Central Europe, and this shaped the thinking about the region. People who identified with the West vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union produced some of this thinking. The West was capitalist, democratic, nationally unified. East Central Europe had a long history of feudal economies, autocratic rule, and violent nationalist conflict. And that especially. Nationalists in many of the successor states had also promoted the same kind of thinking following the collapse of the Habsburg monarchy in 1918. Their stories told how the many nations of East Central Europe had emancipated themselves in 1918 from an impressive, oppressive empire whose rulers had allegedly held them in a state of colonial backwardness. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to be giving this account in this way. Of course, in 1918, the nationalists thought they were seeing a new de democratic and economically promising beginning. And they too saw their society's situations during the Cold War as yet another all too familiar period of economic colonial servitude to yet another empire. And these stories made a lot of sense on an intuitive level and they reinforced Western policies during the Cold War. But these stories also made East Central Europe into an unfamiliar world whose history most observers, historians, journalists, politicians, novelists, whose history they saw as profoundly different from the rest of Europe. And this alien East Central Europe 
became a convenient foil to help define the qualities and virtues of the West, as both Larry Wolf and Maria Todorova have taught us. If these stories of age-old colonialism and exotic difference seem just a bit strange to you today, they should. Istvan's work, and the work of most everyone in this room today, uh, sought to familiarize us with this part of the world, with this part of Europe. And in doing so, they sought to normalize its history to see it not as some historians wrote about it, really as almost psychologically problematic, but rather to recognize that East Central Europe had participated in and initiated all kinds of pan-European developments in the 19th and 20th centuries, from agricultural reform to capitalist industrialization, from the rise of vibrant civic societies to the creation of distinctive civic rights. Just think of the language laws in Imperial Austria. Where else in Europe would you find that? From intellectual and scientific initiatives to the creation also of national myths and state rituals. You could find it all there. The ethnic conflict that made East Central Europe so Eastern could be observed as well in Ireland, Spain, or Italy, to name just three. Istvan himself wrote in The Lawful Revolution about Hungary as a rapidly industrializing and prosperous country in the late 19th century, and about the politically progressive character of the constitutional laws of April 1848, and those are just two tiny examples. So my picture of the older way of thinking about this region is brief and crude. And as I was writing it, I thought, oh, Istvan would immediately criticize me for it and say I was being unfair. But it's the background to my larger argument about Istvan's distinctive legacy to us practitioners of history today. Many of you have heard me speak already many times about a Deac school of history. For over 20 years now, I have argued that this school does exist and that it is coherent, it is recognizable in the ways that its practitioners write about history. The Deac school includes students of Istvan's from several generations, as you can see here, as well as many colleagues with whom he engaged but did not study, who did not study formally with him. Their shared approaches to history writing rest on Istvan's non-programmatic, yet programmatic, ideas about how to consider East Central Europe since around 1750. So, the school is recognizable, both in the topics its practitioners choose and in the ways they go about writing them. That's my lecture. <laughs> now, now I have to fill in some of the details, sorry. The school is not simply a product of Ishan's personal and professional influence. The school doesn't include everyone who practices the history of this region and who knew Ishvan. Historians on both sides of the Atlantic today still dispute some of Ishvan's approaches and promote a very different understanding of East Central Europe. And some of you may know from personal experience that many popular and many government governmental promoted beliefs inside East Central Europe today also dispute or ignore Istvan's approaches. His school does not represent a universal consensus yet. I mean, <laughs> I guess I have nostalgia for the future also. Um, and I'll come back to some of the government promoted beliefs later. Ishvan, of course, himself never set out to create a school of historical thought or practice, and he never saw himself in the role of, as a founder of a school. And in conversation with me, he always and vigorously disputed my references to this school. Oh, to him, the very idea of a school of history named for him was laughable and more than a bit conceited. In some ways, his approach was antithetical to that kind of group effort. I mean, for him, a school would be, you know, there's a couple people dominating it, and they tell people what to write about, and everybody produces the same thing. So, of course, there's no school. In some ways, 
sorry. After all, Ishlan was a practitioner who applied his own very down-to-earth, sensible questions to complex historical situations and phenomena and badly written essays by some graduate students. Isn't that what all historians do? I'm sure he would have asked. Alas, no. So by naming this a school of history, I am naming what I see as a particular intellectual legacy. And I name it in order to continue the practices, approaches, and behaviors that Istvan modeled for us. In my view, the Dayak school, or the Dayak turn, has certainly transformed the way we write history of Habsburg Central Europe, and maybe more of Europe, in the last 40 years. Although we can find elements of this distinctive school or approach in his earliest works, I like to date the informal yet very public founding of the Dayak school to a legendary intervention that Istvan made at an important conference of East Central Europeanists that took place at the University of Indiana in 1966. And I think it was Natasha who already referenced this. Charles and Barbara Jelovich the big hitters in the field at the time, had organized this important conference at Bloomington, Indiana. They invited many of the most important historians in the field, including many from Europe and from behind the Iron Curtain. The conference was so important that the proceedings of each panel were later published in the Austrian History Yearbook and the Jeloviches had invited Istvan to comment on one of the Habsburg monarchy panels that was called The Ruling Nationalities. Many of you cite this exchange in your work, as I do constantly. As the commentator, Istvan issued a brilliantly and deceptively simple challenge to his senior colleagues. I can easily hear, but I can't imitate, Istvan's voice because I heard him say similar things repeatedly while I was a student at Columbia and later. Quote, let me take the bull by the horns and challenge the very topic of this discussion, ruling nationalities. It is my contention, he said, that the subject of this debate is neither justified nor valid. Wow. <laughs> and he's not senior. I would argue that there were no dominant nationalities in the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. There were only dominant classes, estates, institutions, interest groups, and professions. True, German and Magyar nationals formed the majority of these dominant strata of society. But, and this is an important sentence, the benefits they derived from their privileged position were not shared by the lower classes of their own nationalities. End of long quote. Well, today, almost 60 years later, in these exciting words, I hear a challenge to the ruling historiography of the region and a roadmap to a new way to understand its history. Why should scholars concede the blanket importance of nationalism, of ruling nationalities, as a kind of monolithic determining factor in history. By making nations and nationalists the main characters in narratives about Austria-Hungary or East Central Europe, we render so many equally or more important actors and dynamics invisible. Istvan argued that our relentless focus on nationalism oversimplified that phenomenon. It blinded us to equally or more important social, cultural, political, and economic group factors. Istvan called for the study of new kinds of topics in new ways, and by investigating a range of other forms of group identity, we could better understand the motivations that drove individuals to see the world and to act as they did. Now, by the mid-1990s, this quotation, which for a long time was buried in a rather thick volume of the Austrian History Yearbook, it was being cited all the time as a kind of starting point for a growing number of historians who were seeking to escape the hegemony of nationalism in the history writing of the region and to understand Austro-Hungarian society on other terms. 
By the 1990s, too, Ishvan had himself produced two very different classics, The Lawful Revolution and Beyond Nationalism. Both of these works modeled the challenges he issued at Bloomington. But there's another critical implication of his words to consider, one that I think was less apparent at the time when he spoke them. By questioning the primacy of nations or national identities as agents in history, as actors in history, Ishvan opened the door to questioning their very nature or maybe even their very existence. Benedict Anderson, Eric Hobsbawm, and Ernest Gellner may have revived these constructivist theories of the nation. Sorry, I'm using jargon. Ishvan would be appalled. Uh, is theories of the nation from very different perspectives in the 1980s. But Ishvan's wary approach to nationalism and the monarchy was already defining the approaches of the historians who grew up around him over the next half century. Ishvan never denied the power of nationalism and nationhood. He confronted it. He foregrounded its many internal contradictions. And you can almost hear his slightly laughing voice giving you both sides of the paradoxes. The frequent absence of nationalism from people's daily life concerns. When you have to survive, are you really thinking about what na nation you belong to? And its clearly situational character. Yes, you might be thinking about it if you're being persecuted on that basis. He encouraged us to question its primacy in historical narrative and to think beyond its severe limitations. In the introduction to the book Beyond Nationalism, his 1986 work on the Habsburg Officer Corps, Ishvan recounted the contradictions that peppered the nationalist education of his childhood and the later re-education program of the communists. Quote, we were taught, he says, that Czechs, Slovaks, Serbs, Croats, Romanians, Ruthenes, Poles, Italians, and German Austrians had fought shoulder to shoulder with us in the World War. Though, he added, most of these nations had always been our enemies. And, quote, the Romanians, as well as the Czechs, had been particularly cowardly and vile, end quote. We were taught that many Jews fought bravely in the war, though Jewish people were considered the bane of the country. We were further taught that Madra soldiers were the best soldiers in the world, despite the fact that Hungary had not won a single war since the 15th century. End quote. I can only imagine how some people felt when they read those lines. <laughs> After 1948, the communists taught an only slightly different nationalist lesson, that Hungary had been a semi-colony of Western capitalism. Finally, Istvan added to this list of contradictions his own experience as an historian researching the Hungarian Revolution of 1848-49. Especially the terrible choices that Hungarian officers had faced, whether to serve their emperor or their nation. Quote, the documents made clear, he writes, in contradiction to my education, that in 1848-49, at least as many Hungarian officers remained loyal to the Habsburg dynasty as joined the camp of Louis Koshu. What should an historian of East Central Europe conclude from this? What should we think of this? When Istvan considered whether nationality had influenced service in the Habsburg armed forces, he produced no final positive answer. And it's interesting because, because I was looking at the book again recently, and people think there's a conclusion, but there really isn't. He leaves a lot of things open. And this was because, as he implied, the way we understood the very question was wrong. Historians' assumptions about the role of national identity in society rested in part on uncertain ethnic statistics that equated to signs of modern understandings of national belonging. Yet, what did these statistics mean in the 1880s, for example? And under what circumstances had these statistics been formulated and gathered? Did they really measure a person's 
personal commitment? How, Ishtman asked, was mother tongue even determined among military recruits? Quote, even if we assume that it was the recruit himself who gave this information, the many thousands or millions, he said millions, who were bilingual might have given the kind of answer they simply believed the authorities wanted to hear, end quote. In line with his 1967 remarks, he concluded that the key, for example, to promotion and success in the Habsburg officer corps was not your nationality or even your confession, but rather your access to schooling and your family background. Beyond nationalism examined a caste group, officers, one of those groups to whom Dayak referred in the 1967 comments. It was a group of people whose self-identification rested on concerns that were different from those of nationalism. Groups like officers were made up of individuals and individual behavior within this group could not be easily predicted. If we read the book closely, we can see another methodological element of Ishtman's challenge to historians. As many of you pointed out today, Ishtman was always attentive to the ways that human situations produced profound dilemmas in individuals. How people reacted in those situations couldn't simply be predicted by knowing the language they used or the national identification. Again, whether people became active perpetrators of atrocities, for example, whether they avoided conflict, and Ishman always reminded us that Germans who didn't participate in atrocities were not actually themselves persecuted. Whether people went into hiding, the answers to all these questions depended on such a complex human calculus whose outcome could not be predicted by one or two abstract structural factors alone. It was critical to understand the small and great factors that defined belonging to a group like the officers. In her recent essay on Ishvan's legacy, Alison Frank Johnson recently argued that the issue of maintaining the honor of the officer corps depended on many contradictory factors that often left the individual officer in a constant state of internal struggle. You read this book, you think, whoa, how did someone manage to be an officer without losing their mind? Because every day there were situations that made you ask yourself, has my honor been compromised? Has the honor of the officer corps been compromised? How do you respond? Should an officer challenge someone to a duel who offended his honor? Dueling was illegal, of course, but not dueling when the honor of the individual and the corps required it could damage one's career or even bring expulsion from the officer corps, as Ishtman showed. So as Allison points out in her essay, Ishtman used this unbelievable encyclopedic knowledge, and I'm sure we all remember that, um, for all of the various factors that an Austro-Hungarian officer would face in his situations. He used these to interpret the choices that the individuals made. The point of all Ishvan's knowledge about this past world was not to dazzle the listener with his erudition. The point was to understand as much as we possibly could the ways in which the past really is a foreign country. To remove our own assumptions that, oh, we're similar to those people 120 years ago, and to recognize that people functioned under radically different presumptions and understandings of their circumstances. Now, of course, this recognition is common to many historians, and I'm not arguing that Ishvan invented it at all, or that the fact that he insisted on it was exceptional. But he, well, his human-centered, I would call it a human-centered analysis, offered an effective approach to denationalize the histories he studied and to render those other important factors visible. Like the best examples of global and transnational history today, Ishtvan constantly brought local personal examples into conversation with large interpretations showing the contingencies, and the word contingency came up consistently today, that shaped both sides of historical equations, and 
both sides is already too simplified. In Beyond Nationalism, Ishvan offers an array of surprising statistics that force us to confront complexities that we can't adequately explain. But next to these many tables of statistics that Marsha was talking about earlier, we get these wonderful memoirs and biographic essays um, about individuals whose personal stories and career trajectories help to explain the confusion engendered by the statistical data. In asking, for example, why a Jew might have become a career, as opposed to reserve officer, in the Habsburg army, Ishvan immediately seeks for answers in memoirs and biographical accounts. But, but he also tells us we cannot expect to find confessions of individual motivation in these accounts because 120, 150 years ago, these kinds of memoirs focused on people's individual achievements and not on their personal or psychological motivations. Again, the past as a foreign country. The rise of a Deac school may be most obvious in its practitioner's rejection of the nation as the main tool to understand the last 200 years of East Central European history. Ishvan's approach consistently decentered the nation from his narratives, but he does occasionally bring it back in some unexpected ways. And as he admitted in this example from Beyond Nationalism, quote, all my attempts at a nationality analysis have produced only this one conclusion. If the joint army displayed any national bias in its promotions, it was in favor of its Magyar officers. Okay. <laughs> a fact that he added completely contradicted the constant complaints of Magyar nationalists. A lot of us who write about nationalism or nationhood point to the discrepancies, the contradictions that haunt nationalist projects and claims. Nationhood for the Dayak school is always under construction. It's always contested. It's shaped by those from the nation's margins. And if we were talking about a different part of Europe, this might not be so surprising. It might not take so much work. But even today, nationalist myths remain central to the founding of the successor states in East Central Europe. And historians of the so-called West continue to maintain their own prejudices about this allegedly overly ethnic region of Europe in the East. Being in the East means being ethnic. And I'm sorry I say this all the time, but it would be nice if some historians, more historians of Western Europe would um, think a little more about this. No amount of sensible debunking has yet managed to undo these prejudices. And add to this the radical nationalist impulses among many of the region's current political leaders, their willingness to fund historical research that confirms their views, even if this research is done, as we heard earlier, by people with no historical training, I mean, what matters is what they write, not how they got to it. And the willingness of popular his histories to exploit this trend. And we can see how the interventions by the Deac school are more crucial than ever today. I liked very much when Natasha talked about the moral dimension of Ishvan's writing. And what I would have added to what Natasha said is it was moral, not moralizing. In other words, you never have, Ishvan is never on a soapbox. And I worry that I'm too often on a soapbox. So, sorry, Ishvan. Uh, but I think it's absolutely critical that we historians today speak more openly about the uses of history at the moment, especially in East Central Europe, and especially given the war. Um, I don't, maybe I do have nostalgia for the future, but mostly I have anger about the situation in which historians find themselves. We haven't been trained to speak the way I think Ishvan could so well and so eloquently to the public, but we need to do it right now. <laughs>
But the DAC school, and please forgive me for calling it that and for presuming that you all are a part of it, but you are, the school is, isn't about nationalism. It's equally committed to finding answers and explanations by analyzing the experiences and understandings of individuals in history. It does so, we do so, by investigating actions, words, relationships, and experience of all kinds of people from all walks of life, whether they're teachers, officers, shopkeepers, factory workers, students, farmers, or yes, even politicians, because I remember that early Hungary essay by Istvan is so, so good in characterizing uh, the politicians of interwar Hungary. Of course, ideas and laws and ideologies and institutions are critical to this understanding, as many of you pointed out today. So too are rulers and the way they choose to apply laws and policies or not to apply them. But the histories written by the Deak school remain very much multi-directional in their character. Histories that explore how people at very different levels of society and also a state that has very different levels, how they relate to each other and understand each other. When I first started thinking about a Deak school of history, it wasn't simply because I saw so many commonalities that linked my own approaches to history with those of a lot of people in this room and a lot of people who can't be here today. It wasn't simply because of shared experiences of a generous and humane teacher and friend. It was as much because so many of my own students, and now students of my students, they have taken up the specific challenges outlined by Istvan in their own work. And according to Dan Yunofsky, they're still giving the same lectures as well, which I thought was a wonderful thing. They do this in a range of very different kinds of topics economic history, diplomatic history, legal, military, international, social history, cultural history, gender studies, and the history of science and technology. I see in them how new generations could possibly build on Ishvan's work in such creative and productive ways. And personally, this realization brings me great joy. Not because I see that Istvan's remarkable influence lives on in the work of new historians, as it does, but because this phenomenon reminds me, something I learned from Istvan, that in a profession where we and our students often experience severe isolation, we are in fact always part of a larger community, in this case, part of a family of choice. Together, we can continue to construct Deak schools of history. Thank you, Ishvan, and thank all of you. <laughs>